Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, let, let me introduce Stephanie the Wonder Rabbit. Stephanie is a technology geek. She likes to chew on Ethernet cables. Fortunately for Stephanie, Ethernet is low voltage. Unfortunately for me, I now always know where my network problems are. That's why I went wireless right there. Let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Max Kilger, and um, I'm a social psychologist by training. Uh, I'm the chief behavioral scientist at the HoneyNet Project. Uh, I'm one of the data geeks there, as well as uh, one of two profilers in the group. So just to sort of introduce you to sort of where, where, where I'm coming from, uh, I started using computers about 30 years ago. I started with a PDP-11, uh, flipping the lights and the switches, and reading and programming. It was a lot of fun. And then worked my way through undergraduate school in the University Computer Center, slaving away. And when I got to graduate school, I went to graduate school in Silicon Valley. And that was really interesting because not only was there a lot of cool stuff going on, it was about the time that com the digital revolution was happening. Sort of growing up with the, with the Apple II, the Apple I. Uh, and I hung out with a lot of really interesting people. And pretty soon I said, you know, it's not just sort of geek stuff that's really cool, but it's really what is technology doing to us? How is technology changing the way we behave, the way we think, the way we perceive things, and the way that other sort of treat us? And pretty soon I said, hey, this is pretty interesting. I think this is sort of what I'd like to do and, and study. So that's what I'm doing some research on. Um, so tonight we're going to look a little bit at digital identity and uh, some, some of the psychological things and some of the technical things with identity. And hopefully we'll learn a little something and have a bunch of fun. So the first thing I want to do is start off the evening with a little relevant entertainment. So hopefully this isn't going to be too loud, but let's give it a whack and see what happens. Please work, God. Okay, just a little clip from The Prisoner for those of you who are old enough to remember or have seen the reruns. Pretty cool show. I saw an entire um, psychology class at the university taught on that show every week. So, why don't we go ahead and get started? Identity. Our sense of identity is really a necessary thing for our psychological well being. If you don't have a good sense of who you are, that's really going to cause you a lot of problems. And so identity is a very key element to sort of having a reasonably decent, well-deserved, well-lived life on this planet. Identity is also multidimensional. It's not just one thing. Hey, I'm Max. It's got legal dimensions. It's got social dimensions. It's got uh, all sorts of kinds of dimensions that that uh, are, are kind of interesting. We're going to explore some of those dimensions tonight. So it's also sort of multi-dimensional. Um, interestingly, digital technology has had a really significant impact on our sense of identity and how we construct it. That is, how we see ourselves and how others see us. 
And hopefully, I'll just give you a tiny glimpse about what might happen or think about what we might become as ghosts in the machine. First, let's start out with the idea that identity is a process. And it begins at birth. That is, there's a gender assignment, and there's usually some sort of given name. This is very powerful. This is an ascribed identity. Someone says, oh, look, male, uh, let's call him John. OK, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good name. And if you don't think it's very powerful, um, think what happens. What's the first thing you ask when you hear someone's had a baby? You say, oh, was it a boy or a girl? And then the next question is, what did you call her? And if you say, well, I don't know, they kind of look at you like, hmm? <laughs> and you say, well, what do you call her? I said, well, we're not really sure yet. Maybe in a couple of months we'll know. That doesn't work too well either. And in fact, if you don't do this very quickly, even the government will step in and get involved and go, OK, you got this kid, name it, and name it now. So, um, and disrupting this kind of ascribed status is, is actually um, sort of very sort of disruptive. So for example, if I pick someone else, uh, someone in class uh, here in the audience, let's pick you. Your name is? Mark. Mark. OK, Mark. Well, I hate to tell you this, Mark, but you were switched at birth. You know, that's what your parents say. Well, I guess it's not a big surprise to you, but if that were to happen to you, just think of your identity. It's like, oh my God, even though something that happened 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's like, uh-oh, who am I? So it's a very powerful thing. So as I mentioned, there are sort of different processes or different dimensions involved in identity. There's legal, there's social, there's commercial, there are other realms like government. Um, and we're just going to take a look at one social process for the moment, and that's status processes and their role in identity. Now, status processes are pretty interesting. They happen all the time, every day. They happen to everybody in this room. When people sit down and look at and try and gather information and say, well, who is this person? What are their characteristics? Uh, we're talking about working out this problem. Who's right? Is it them? Is it me? Uh, no one really knows. Where do I fit in in this hierarchy? I'm not really sure. Let's find out. So there, um, what you're doing is you're gathering a lot of information about people in a status process, trying to figure out who's, who's the leader, who's not the leader. Uh, things might be demographic variables like age and gender and education. Or there might be very specific skills like networking skills or C++ programming skills. Those all help you sort of figure out, well, where do I belong? What's my identity? Now, we gather this information about others and about us through sort of direct and indirect means. That is, some of the information that we get from people, it's very direct. They say, where'd you go to school? I said, well, I got my you know, degree at Stanford. Oh, OK. And I know that. And you say, well, uh, how old are you? Well, I'm 52. Well, OK. That's good. And the deal is, often, these kind of exchanges happen in the real world in face-to-face. And when you're in face-to-face -face interaction with people, there are a lot of verbal and nonverbal cues that are sort of going on back and forth. There's actually a very large bandwidth. And so now I'm going to have to pick on another audience member. Uh-oh. Who's it going to be? How about you? Will you play? Oh, OK. You speak English, though, right? A bit? Uh-oh. Maybe not. OK. Well, we how about you, sir? Sure? Yeah? Come. OK. So what, what we're going to do is have a little face-to-face -face conversation, you and I, for about you know, 60 seconds. And you can tell me whatever you'd like to tell me. It could be about your day. It could be about the conference. It could be about your at work, your girlfriend. It doesn't really matter. Give me about 60 seconds worth of stuff. Uh, uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I really wouldn't know uh, where to start. <laughs> oh, tell me about your day. Um, well, I woke up at the turn holler. Okay. After uh, sl re decently sleeping uh, through the night and uh, got up and walked all the way here to get a, well, 
almost all the way here to get a decent cup of coffee because here at the Congress Center it's, uh, <laughs> I won't even uh, get started. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and then uh, I just uh, found uh, people I was here with uh, and we sit down and... Uh, okay. What else? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, why are you standing so close? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, let's stop for a second. Thanks. You were a really, you were a really good sport. Now, what you don't really think about consciously is this huge bandwidth of information that's being exchanged back and forth between the two of us. There are things that have been studied in the research, such as eye gaze. For example, looking while speaking is an indicator of high status. So if I do a lot of looking while speaking, or he did a lot of looking at in my eyes directly while speaking, that him indicates higher status. Looking while listening is another status indicator. If I look away while he's speaking, that's an indicator that I think he has lower status than I do, for example. Gestures are also important. Gestures out like this also indicate higher status. Speech rate, the number of non-fluencies, the ums, the ahs, and things like that are also indicators. And so there are a whole lot of different things, including space. Uh, you, you notice I, I sort of creeped up on him there, slowly and surely, and, and there are different sort of personal space parameters for people. Uh, if you don't believe me, if you have a significant other, walk down the sidewalk with him like this, and as you're walking down, just suddenly start to peel out like this, a little farther, a little farther, a little farther away, until he or she says, what's wrong? People monitor and, and exchange information very quickly, and there's a lot of bandwidth. So in face-to-face, -face, that's really, really important. Okay, so now, the absence of verbal and nonverbal cues in the digital world really sort of disrupts this identity validation process. For example, one of the common communication, uh, communication channels is email. When someone sends you an email and their name is Heidi, what do you know about them? Well, they're female. Well, at least maybe, yeah, I don't know. Unless you've physically seen Heidi, you're not really sure. Well, maybe even when you've seen Heidi, you're not really sure. I don't know. Someone claims to be an expert Perl programmer. How do you verify that claim? Yes, yes? You, you need to uh, stay in the light. Oh, yeah, stay in the light for the camera. Okay, sorry. I wander a lot. So um, they send you a sample of your code. You say, wow, this is a really cool code. Then you go, well, did they really write this stuff? I don't know. So there's a lot, there's a lack of cues that help you figure out who this person is in relationship to you and what they've told you about themselves. You say, well, that's okay. I got a webcam and I got audio. That's okay. Uh, uh, now I'll be able to do everything. But we know from academic research that even with vo uh, video and audio, even with decent cameras, you still miss a lot of stuff. You just don't get it. And so it's not a, an effective communication unless it's face to face. And in fact, if it were, you know, why would I fly my tail 10 hours here and give this talk in, in freezing you know, Berlin when I live in Florida with palm trees and 70 degree weather and bunny rabbits? I could just do it from there. But, doesn't work that way. The second idea I sort of want to impress on you is that identity is a temporally unstable element. That is, persistence as a characteristic is a key attribute of identity. Now, every element of identity has its own sort of little separate timeline. Some elements of identity are very long, for example, uh, you get a national identity card. I think you have one here in Germany. And in general, unless they screw up, that's your card for the rest of your life. Uh, another example of a somewhat slow timeline is occupation. You often enter an occupation and you stay there for many years. Well, maybe some of you. Some of you like, oop, hired, oop, fired, oop, hired, oop, fired. But anyway, for the most part, you often stick it out for a while at a job. An example of a really short timeline this RSA token around my neck. Every 60 seconds, I get a different number and a different identity to the network that says, here's Max. 60 seconds later, here's Max. So, some timelines are really, very short. So the one thing I'd sort of like you to take away 
for the moment from this is identity is a temporally unstable element and that any identity has some probability p to exist at time t and some probability q that it ceases to exist at some later date. Now, online identities are sort of a special instance of identity. You're already familiar with things like passwords. Passwords age. That makes reasonable sense. When we shop at a commercial website, we get a session ID or that sort of dies at the end of our shopping visit. So you pick stuff, put it in the cart, it charges you for it, and that ID sort of dies. And another example is people may drop one digital identity and adopt another one in an online game, for example. So one day you're an orc, the next day you're you know, an avatar, swinging a sword, et cetera. Now, for example, here, people at the conference often use or create identities that are not linked to identities associated with them in various databases for usually pretty good reasons. So ask the question, why might an identity cease to exist? Well, maybe the individual disassociates them from the identity. That might be one thing. Eh, I don't want to be that anymore. Uh, some entity forcibly disassociates the individual from the identity. You, you kick them off the channel, you, you whack their account, whatever it happens to be, you're gone. Or sometimes the identity will just sort of expire. Now, one good sort of devil's advocate question is, does an identity ever really cease? After you die, are you, is your identity gone? No, I think, you know, if somewhere, if there's some instance that remains either in the physical, the cyber, or memory, wetware world, then has that identity really ceased to exist? Well, I'm not really sure. That's a really good question. Don't have a good answer to it. Consequences of temporally unstable identities. Well, persistence of identity is important for InfoSec purposes. Authentication, authorization, often require sort of time-stable identities, stuff that stays the same. Um, and identity management architectures often rely on temporally stable identities, the stuff that's got to stay stable over time, some reasonable time window. An exception to this is the RSA token, where it changes every 60 seconds, but you know that on some server somewhere, it's also changing every 60 seconds, and so you have some sort of parallel system somewhere matching your identity going out in time. So that's kind of an interesting exception. So what are some psychological consequences of temporally unstable identities? Well, if you look back in the old days, back in the old films and things like that, you often saw lots of references to, oh, what will happen to my reputation? and things like that, where people spent a lot of time, months, years, and decades, building reputations and hanging on to them. But now, with the digital revolution, we've accelerated the number and the pace at which these identities or reputations emerge and expire. That means that somehow, psychologically, we have to be able to tolerate this faster and more frequent identity change in order to sort of keep a sense of well-being. So you still go, gee, I really know who I am. It's cool. Now, if you don't do that, you may represent, you may sort of lose some sense of identity or loss of self. And then it's not, you're not going to be sort of, sort of psychologically balanced. And so that could be sort of a, a bad thing. Let's move on to situational identity. Now, social scientists have long observed that lots of identities are sort of tied to situations. Uh, and it, hap it happens to appear a lot in the non-digital world. People hold and they change roles all the time. For example, you're a concert goer, you go to a Stevie Nicks concert, or your father, or you're an airline passenger. Well, that seems to be getting tougher to do these days. Um, and situational identity in the digital world is much more rich and it's much more complex. So, for, for example, you might be, have a role as an orc battling a hero in a game, and then in another situation, a member of a hacking team in the middle of an IRC chat, and then in another situation, an employee logging on to their employer's network. So each situation, you have sort of a different identity. Now, 
there's kind of a problem with that. And one of the problems is these situational identities are most salient, are most evident to you when you're present in the situation. Um, so often there's a lack of sort of communication between these situational identities. That is, you move out of one and into the other, and it's a good thing because sometimes these identities don't coexist very well. And a good example of that is a person who's an information security employee by day and a member of a hacking group by night. Oops. And if they meet, well, that's not quite so good. It's a little tougher to sort of resolve. One example of someone who's sort of looked at identity as situational identity um, is Jordan, Hauser, and Foster. They have they designed what they called augmented social networks. Pretty interesting paper, pretty cool idea. It's based on four sort of basic principles. Principle number one is persistence of identity. If you have an identity, it's gonna be stable for a while over time and it's gonna stay there. Number two, interoperability between online communities. That is, they're talking about transferring identities from one online community to the other. And so that's gotta be able to work. Number three, is brokered relationships. That is, well, I trust Phil and Phil trusts Bill, so I trust Bill as well. Um, and the idea here is if you trust the person in one area, you can trust them in another. So if I know someone who's a great C++ coder, uh, I might trust them, trust that person to recommend a good book to read for fun, because I, I think they'll probably have a book that the same kind of interest that I will would be pretty cool. The breakdown and this sort of identity transfer scheme often comes in this sort of interoperability assumption. For example, I have a very good friend who's a tremendously great researcher. Uh, she's really fabulous. Well, these, this idea of SN says, well, you know what? Since she's a really competent, really great researcher and you trust her, um, you could probably trust her. Let's move that trust in online, another online community. Let's move it to eBay. And I go, well, I don't know about that because I know her really well. I know that she's really bad at paying bills. Uh, she always has her cable shut off. She forgets to pay it. Often forgets to pay her insurance. She's so basically a huge path of financial mayhem wherever she goes. And so I would never, ever, ever, even though I love her dearly, uh, buy, you know, expect to buy something from her or sell something to her and expect to get paid. So this idea doesn't always work quite as well as you'd like it to. I think it's sort of a utopian kind of idea, a really nice concept, but eh, when you really try and make it work, it often doesn't. Well, this suggests that in a digital world, you know, large identity architectures that people are trying to build, like federated identity systems uh, that rely to some degree on situational identities, or authenticate and validate or grant privileges, may at some point get themselves into trouble as well. That is, you know, the typical rules of I know something, I have something in terms of authentication uh, just basically may not cut it in the end. Okay, next up. The other day idea I want to talk to you about a bit is class versus unique identifiers. That is, things that identify you. Some things are unique identifiers. Uh, that is, there's sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between you and the identifier. And in theory, things like a national identity, a card, a fingerprint, DNA sample. Of course, now we know these aren't perfect. You could have an identical twin. Uh, the government could screw up and give your ID number to another person. But in general, yeah, they're pretty much unique identifiers. And then there's a second class of identifiers, that is class identifiers. This type of identifier associates that actors belong to a class of individuals, a one-to-many relationship. So for example, you're female, okay? So you belong to the female class, there are lots of other females that do. You're a college graduate, lots of other college graduates. You're a bunny rabbit owner, maybe not too many of those, but there's some. User group other and Unix systems, and so you can belong to this sort of class identifier. Now, in the non-digital world, we'll just use these examples again, age and gender and college educated. Now, suppose you try to alter your identity. So, for example, try and alter your gender. Uh, you could put on some makeup, 
band of dress if you're a guy. Uh, shave your legs. Uh, let's see, what else you have to do? Oh, shave up here. Yeah, this will have to go. Um, and so you can try and sort of pass like that. But it's actually kind of tough. For example, I know someone who is a transgendered person. That is, that used to be a he. And now, after a lot of years and an operation, they're a she. But if you take DNA, she's still a he. So it's kind of tough to change. Um, things with age, you can try to look a little younger with age. Lots of women try to do that. A little makeup. College education, you can say, I went to this school. Um, you may not have gone to that school, but you can look it up on the web and know a lot of facts about it, and you may be actually just sort of try and pass it off, but you probably eventually kind of get caught. And same thing with unique identifiers. You have a passport, got mine here somewhere. Um, it's kind of hard to forge. You can do it, but it's kind of hard. There are a lot of clues that say, you know, this kind of looks kind of funky. So bandwidth for information in this non-digital world is really pretty high. It makes it hard to alter and sort of maintain identities. And this creates sort of a gap between unique identifiers and class identifiers. It's pretty big. Now, let's move to the digital world. Let's take these same examples, age and gender and college educated. For example, gender can be altered with just a nickname change and away you go. I'm no longer Henry, I'm Heidi. Age can be altered in an explicit statement, I'm 14 years old. Or you can, uh, college education be explicitly claimed and backed by some background. Gee, I went to Stanford. Uh, the farm is really great. The farm is a nickname for the campus. Um, I really like I really like Mem Chu, it's really beautiful. That's the name of the memorial church. If you, you drop enough clues, um, people will go, oh, for sure, went there. Uh, other things, bank account numbers, social security numbers, user passwords. There's not a lot of bandwidth to say, you know, something doesn't quite match. Something's not quite coherent here. And coherence is actually one of the things that profilers use a lot in determining sort of like what's going on, who this person might be, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot harder to sort of change because the bandwidth's a lot lower. And so the gap between class identifiers and unique identifiers is a lot smaller in the online world. So you can create identities in the digital world. You can use cover information. For example, create a website with information consistent with the digital identity you want to adopt. The search engine crawls your website like Google, picks it up the information, indexes it, someone Googles you and they say, oh look, Google, Google says this guy went to Stanford and he has a patent and uh, 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 he's a world's greatest dancer or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff that you could put up there. Now, the use of limited bandwidth, you can also control or conceal telltale identity markers. For example, in the FBI Innocent Images program, which is a program that's used to um, entice um, sex offenders online, uh, FBI agents portray 14-year-old girls. And in fact, 14-year-old girls teach the FBI agents how to be 14-year-old girls. How they talk, what they think, how they act, etc. In fact, well, one thing I forgot I left out is when I had this nice sort of uh, conversation with a gentleman here, um, I, I do this in a lot of my talks, um, one warning, never do this with an armed FBI agent. <laughs> it does not work. <laughs> it really scared the shit out of me. I just, he just, he wouldn't move and he stared at me like this, like, oh God, he's gonna shoot me or something. Uh, I don't know. So anyway. Okay. Let's look at one other uh, sort of uh, dimension of identity. Deterministic versus probabilistic identifiers. Now, deterministic identifiers are characteristics or pieces of yourself that are known with sort of a high degree of uh, sort of certainty. You're female, my age is 24, uh, I own a Jeep, car, vehicle, things like that. They're sort of, they're sort of uh, they can be verified, they can be validated by sort of collaborative 
or corroborating rules and clues and things. So that actually makes them kind of deterministic. But there are also probabilistic identifiers. Oops, into the light. Stay in the light loop. Okay. Um, that is, pieces of information that are known with some probability much less than, you know, p equals sort of limit of one. Uh, often these sort of probabilistic identifiers uh, involve uh, a modifier or levels of certain attributive characteristic. And I'm going to sort of cite one here in a second. So, for example, expert C++ programmer. Well, that's an interesting label, but it's really kind of a probabilistic label. Because there are a couple of issues. Issue number one is the identifier is really relational to others in the universe. Because how do you know? Well, there are others that better you. What's really expert? Well, this guy's a lot better than you. Does that make him the expert and you the non-expert? So it makes things a bit fuzzy, it makes things more probabilistic. Another issue is it's more difficult to verify and validate a probabilistic kind of identity claim in an environment like the web. Okay? So one interesting thing about these probabilistic identifiers is they often cause a lot of status conflicts in the online communities, uh, in the hacking community. And one of the reasons is people in the hacking community for much of the year communicate by email, communicate by RIRC chat, uh, may communicate by phone, but phone's a pretty small bandwidth kind of thing too. And so they don't get a chance to get together and meet face to face and work these clues out, exchange information back and forth. And so when you don't do that, these conflicts sort of arise. Who's the leader? Do I know better than this guy or does that guy know really what he's doing? Where's my position at hierarchy? Can I really say this? Do you think the other guys will, will say yes? All sorts of processes like that. And they sort of fail because you don't have these face-to-face -face verbal and nonverbal cues to say, to sort of exchange information back and forth. Uh, it's very effective when you're face-to-face. -face. You can work it out very quickly. And that's one reason why conferences, like this conference, are really very functional in the hacking community because they allow these kind of face-to-face -face interactions to occur and validation and exchange of clues, verbal and nonverbal clues, and it's actually a very good thing for the community. It keeps the sort of the lid on things. It keeps uh, status conflicts down. Well, Unfortunately, there's another meaning to probabilistic uh, identifiers. Guess what, friends? There are other folks out there creating identities for you, if you hadn't already guessed, and I'm sure you have. Commercial entities, governmental entities, and military entities are creating databases and digital identities of you in them. Hmm, that may be not quite so good. I don't know. First of all, I don't have really control of that. It's like, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Where did they get the information? Is the information even correct? I don't know. Now, these probabilistic identifiers that they have in these databases, whether it's commercial or military or government, may be probabilistic or deterministic. Now, unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, they're not really going to come visit you and say, oh, look, you're male and you look about 47 years old and uh, uh, that is a Jeep outside. Okay, we'll write that down. So, a lot of the information that's stored in these databases, well, often the nature of these databases is they're like Swiss cheese. That is, there are lots of holes in them. They don't know. They say, well, I got a field here, this person, we, um, we think they, 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 they travel a lot to the Middle East. Uh, that's our variable, and I look on this person, and then data's missing. We don't know. Hmm. That's bad. Well, these entities don't like holes. Holes don't allow them to do stuff. It's like, I can't make a prediction because I don't know if this person travels to the Middle East a lot. Uh-oh, what will I do? Well, there's an answer. And that answer often is, okay, if it's not there, let's model it. Yeah. Uh, so. Data may be missing because it's incomplete, because of logistical issues, because they can't collect it. And data may be missing or complete because the concept or variable they're trying to create is abstract. So, for example, um, in the commercial world, you're always looking for high-income people. In the U.S., there's something called socioeconomic status, or SES, and they look at income, education, 
occupational status, uh, things like that, and they say, ah, okay, you're a middle class person, you're an upper class person, you're a working class person, and that's how they can create models to do that. Pretty simple statistical models. Um, but if you go around and say, they probably class me as mm -mm, upper middle class. If I look in my wallet, pull my wallet out, there's no card that says, hi, you're upper middle class, welcome. It's a pretty abstract construct. So, but there are lots of other abstract constructs out there besides that. So present, for example, um, what's a terrorist? Hmm, that's a really good question. So often this stuff is modeled. And uh, I, I know I spent uh, about a year on a National Academy Counterterrorism Committee, and so sometimes they have to model stuff. People model stuff. And so they put, put probabilities on things. What's the probability that this guy is a terrorist? What's the probability that this guy might do something? What's the probability? So there's a lot of holes in the data, and you can model it, and it'll give you a probability. But if there's an 80% chance you're a terrorist, there's a 20% chance you're not. Oops, uh-oh. And it gets worse because let's imagine that instead of two things, two events, A and B, terrorist, not terrorist, suppose they're like 10. Well, the way these statistical models work in general is they look at the probability. You got 10 probabilities. And oh look, here's a 0 0.2 and a 0 0.1 and a 0.15. And it may turn out that the top probability for you for some certain designation is maybe 0 0.2 or 0 0.22, 22 chances out of 100. Since that's top probability out of all the 10 things, that's what the model's gonna say you are. Whoops, that doesn't sound so good. So probabilistic identities are, 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 are kind of a touchy thing and they can be a real problem. So. Ah, I want to say just a little bit about this. This is one of my favorite harangues. It'll be short. Um, I really like George Herbert Mead. He was a social interactionist, sociologist, and he studied symbolic and created symbolic interactionism in sociology. He had sort of two very cool, interesting concepts, one called the I, one called the me. The me was really the social self. That is, part of your identity really comes, a great deal of it comes from how other people interact with you, what they say to you, how they treat you, uh, things like that. And so you create your identity on how other people behave or interact with you. And secondly, there's the I, which is sort of the novel or sort of the ego, sort of like, ah, okay, well, this is really me, regardless of what other people say. And so we can see that our psychological sense of identity is really not just um, us or what we think, but it's a lot of what other people think and how we perceive other people perceive us. And I, I do this because I always like to sort of inject this computers and machines as social identities. That is, in, in Mead's theory, it was pretty simple. All you had to do to be a social actor, like a person, for example, was exchange meaningful social symbols. And the meaningful social symbols is a, was a pretty general definition. I've got 15 minutes, good fab. And so if you carefully study how people interact with machines, you see that the machine and the person are exchanging meaningful symbols. Ah, well, does that mean that the machine is a social actor? Well, I don't know, but you'll notice peop the way people sort of in the tech and the non-tech world sort of anthropomorphize computers. They have moods. It's being me. Uh, I'm going to beat that machine no matter what. Uh, and so, well, machines might actually become sort of uh, social actors. I watched the um, robotics thing, which is actually pretty cool on television. Didn't have a chance to get there to see it, uh, the robotics lecture today. And it was interesting. I actually saw the Eibel thing in the speaker's bureau, and she was sort of letting it play around. And it was sort of like people were treating it like a dog. Literally, it's like, oh, look, it's sleeping. Oh, look, it's barking. And so um, that's something I just wanted you to sort of keep in mind in terms of identities might not just be people, but might be machines. So I'm going to start to wrap up so I have just a little bit of time for questions. Um, 
our sense of identity is likely to become more and more fragmented as we and others sort of build additional identities for ourselves. Uh, will we be able to adapt without some psychological penalties? We're going to be some, so fragmented that we have so many identities. Will we just become sort of wispy ghosts in the machine? I don't have a good answer to that yet. It's something that I, I don't really know. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting is that uh, maybe someday in the future, meeting face to face will be kind of weird. It'll be kind of odd. You do all your shopping online. You do your communication online. You do your work at home online. But meeting someone in the flesh might turn out to be kind of strange. And so that's something to sort of keep in, keep in mind that m that might happen in the future. And also, one other idea I want to plant is the social theory about the sense of identity and self that is social theory have some implications for the technical arena, such as identity management systems. That is, can it help go beyond I have something, I know something for authentication, identification? Um, does a more psychological understanding of identity contribute to you know, identity schemes like Cameron's seven laws of identity? Things like that sort of keep in mind and think about. Uh, finally, for those, in the par those paranoid in the audience, can we outwit, outrun entities that attempt to identify us without our knowledge? Uh, my sense is that digital technology uh, not only gives others the ability to eventually, sort of efficiently construct multiple identities, but at the same time, you're able to sort of shed, create them and shed them faster than some other entity, like a government or a commercial enterprise, can gather them, collect them, aggregate them, analyze them, and figure them out. So hopefully, you can basically run like this, shedding sort of identities as you go behind you and keep ahead of the sort of the maw that's running after you. Uh, okay, thanks for lifting. I'm Dr. Max Kilger. At least I think I'm Dr. Max Kilger. I'm not really sure. Uh-oh, gotta go check? No, well, no, okay. So anyway, I'll stop for a second and I'll hand the microphone off to one of the audio angels or to the first person who wants a question and away we go. I have two remarks, not a question. Um, <laughs> you said that a person online can have uh, several identities one after the other. I think it's even worse. I can have several identities at one time. I can be in a multi-user dungeon environment and simultaneously can be on the IRC having a different identity. Yeah. And the second point is I think in, on the internet, every identity is probabilistic because there is a 50-50 chance that I'm male or female if I pretend to be male or female. Or you can do it with any, any other uh, thing. I agree. I, I, think, I, I think both of the comments are, are, are quite true. Uh, uh, on, online, it's always sort of going to be probabilistic because you don't have those verbal and nonverbal cues. So I'm going to I'm going to try see if there are any other questions. Quiet bunch. No. Ah, yes. Okay. Let's. Uh, yeah, you can pass it this way. I can keep this one. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, really sure whether um, this, this point you made uh, about this social status problems um, and somehow the need for face-to-face -face contact is really true uh, or, or really exists in all, all cases because in some sense, I mean, for example, uh, in order to develop some, some program, uh, it might not be necessary uh, to get all the additional attributes uh, of a, another person. Uh, perhaps what the, the Wikipedia guys are showing up, there might be some example where this is not happening and nevertheless it seems to work. Yeah, I, I, I think that's correct to some degree, but I still would agree that it, it, your identity is, is very sort of probabilistic. And for example, what if the code doesn't work? 
What's the problem? Is it because, oh, well, wrong operating system version? Or is it because the guy who wrote this stuff doesn't know what they're doing? You have to go look and see. So, eh, not so sure. Another question. Anybody else? Um, yeah. you, uh, you were mentioning that um, in the context of uh, augmented social networks or more generally online, uh, one is able to build up multiple identities. So um, the question is that, uh, is it going to cause a, um, oh well, at, at what point is it going to be negative for the user to, to build up multiple identities? At the, at the intro you were mentioning that uh, personal or psychological drawbacks could occur. So is that going to be critical? I, I think that's a really good question. I think, I think there is some limit. I mean, I sort of experience it in my own personal life. I got sort of a day job where I earn money, and I have a sort of this thing where I get to go have fun and talk and do research, and then I got something else on the burner, and so it kind of, it kind of stresses me. Kind of psychologically, it sometimes is a bit difficult to handle all that stuff. So I think there is a limit somewhere, and people will reach it, and then they're going to have to do something about it. Uh, something about the IRC. Uh, you talked about trust. Yes. I found out that on IRC, people seem to trust others, perhaps because they don't know them, or although they don't know them, I don't know. I made the experience that people told me stories about their life, about real bad problems. They wouldn't tell anyone in real life. Yes, that's actually true, that IRC and sort of machine-to-machine -machine communication where you're not face-to-face, -face, you're often able to sort of mm, share a bit more. However, you also have to be careful because how much of it is true? How do you know? Maybe some of it's not true. Uh, you have to look at the, if you watch someone, people are pretty good information gatherers. When someone lies, there are often a number of verbal, nonverbal cues that show up that say, I'm not telling the truth, but they're not available. Uh, in that medium, and so you have a problem. Yep. Another, another question? Oh. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you being from the US, I guess you're familiar with the CAPS, CAPS uh, oh, program. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Do you have some comments on that, on, on how they treat identities? You want to beat me now or later? <laughs> no, no. What, did you design it? No, thank God I didn't. No, no, no. Okay, yeah, what do you want to know? Well, uh, just in general, do you, do you, um, you obviously seem to think it isn't optimal. Uh, I don't either. Um, do you know if, if the, the um, uh, FAA, is it? Or have some plans on, on improving whatever? There are plans, well, yeah, there are plans on improving it. I don't want to, I'm not going to put words in their mouth. I don't want to speak for them. Uh, they, are, they are working on different things. Uh, how effective they're going to be, I, I just don't really know. Uh, depends on who's doing it, how good they are, uh, what variables they use. Um, but there are always going to be false positives, and there are always going to be false negatives. You're never going to get out of it. And so uh, it's, it's never going to be perfect, never, ever. No, right. That's, that's kind of the, the impression that I have as well, that the best you can do is, or Presumptively, the, the best you can do is just random searches. Uh, yeah, random helps to a degree. Um, one of the things I want to do before people run like crazy out is I'm doing a bit of identity research here. So um, if you're interested in helping with the research a bit, I'm doing like short, anonymous, 10-minute interviews. So either come see me after the talk, or I'm not hard to miss. I'll be here for the whole conference. Just tap me on the shoulder. We'll make a little 10-minute appointment, and uh, we'll have a sort of a semi-anonymous chat. So anyway, uh, I wanted to make sure to plug that in before we uh, see if we had any other questions. I think you had a question. Uh, just a remark to what you said to her. Uh, you said that you can't be sure that it's true what people say on RSC. There are studies that show that people on IRC are more open and more truthful, more honest than in real life, because there is a gap between uh, the sender and the receiver. You don't see him. Correct. That's entirely true. They are more truthful, but not 100% truthful. And without those cues, you can't tell what's real, what's not. So, yeah. 
Okay, I have another question. Sure. Uh, maybe from an, uh, another direction. You were talking about some uh, stuff like um, identity of an individual, or just maybe the transforming of the um, of the identity of individuals uh, by their acting or something like that. Uh, my question is, um, what and how do you think um, identity can be or just is transforming um, from an individual one to these um, corporate identities, you know? Um, especially in my way of thinking is that we, when we just um, um, yeah, travel around in these digital worlds, yeah, uh, you cannot um, divorce one world from the other. And when we just uh, go into the internet, you, we will just lose, uh, or just, um, it's just all, maybe our own chosen way to give a part from our identity uh, away to just join the big pool of corporate identity, you know? And how do you think uh, we are just in, yeah, yeah how to say, how do you think it's, uh, is it maybe um, dangerous or maybe like that? Because losing this part of your own personal identity is just maybe like losing a big part of yourself. And how do you think this way of uh, the identity is transforming? I, I think that's a really good point. And I don't think I have a really good answer other than I think that um, you are probably going to lose a bit of your identity. You are losing control over your identity. And I think that actually is probably not going to be so good for you from a psychological standpoint. And so it, it just depends on how much can you adapt, how well can you adapt. At what point does it really sort of become critical and then become a real problem? So I, I, I think there, there is some concern there. I would agree. Is that it? Sure. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Um, I'll stay after if you want to chat for a little bit, but uh, I really enjoyed talking to you guys. Thanks for having me here. See you again soon, I hope.